Hello and welcome to another Arts Talk here in the Claire Trevor School of the Arts at UCI. We've been doing a series of chats with vital members of our faculty. It happens that we've begun our series of Arts Talks with confrontational and very chatty inter uh, interactions with our four chairs, the chairs of Art, Dance, Drama, and Music. And today we're going to be talking to Stephen Tucker, the chair of the really remarkable music department at UCI has a venerable history, one of the original, of course, departments of the School of the Arts that's been through really, really wonderful evolutionary steps that we'll have a chance to chat about here. Um, Stephen, welcome to our talk. Let's begin by having you tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where have you come from? How long have you been at UCI? What is your specialty? Um, let us know who you are. Oh, well, nice to see you, Stephen. Uh, well, let me start first with how long I've been at UCI. I came to UCI in 20, 2000, actually, year 2000. So I'm thinking about uh, 20 years or somewhere around there that I've been there. So then the big jump, where did I come from? Well, I was born in Jamaica. That's West Indies, you know, in Kingston. And I have an identical twin who is also a musician and also a conductor. So we grew up in Jamaica studying piano and um, playing dual piano works, two pianos together. And then the family moved to New York City. And my brother decided that, well, he had had a little too much of the music for them. So he decided to become a commercial pilot, of course. Uh, I'll, I'll set your mind at ease. He came back to music after that. He <laughs> came to his senses. So I, I went to New York, and then from there, I went to school in Massachusetts, out of Massachusetts. I went to the Vienna Conservatory. I'd always wanted to do conducting. So leaving piano and organ as my primary emphasis, I went into conducting and studied at the Vienna Conservatory for a long day, and came back did more conducting, and then went to UCLA, did my doctorate. And from there, I was hired at UCI. So I've been here for that time, conducting the orchestra, doing the opera, uh, things like that, trying to collaborate, collaborate with the different departments, you know, in particular in bands, but some drama also. So that's where I've been, and that's where I am. Actually, I remember very clearly when you came to the School of the Arts here at UCI, I remember that it was, um, we all considered it to be quite a coup, given your background and given what you do. Of course, I, I do have to tell you that it's more than been fulfilled during your time here. So I'm just like your students, like the members of the orchestra, et cetera. I'm just delighted that you're continuing to develop your your skills and your and your love for conducting. Was there something particular of the trajectory from Jamaica to being a major international conductor doesn't necessarily seem to me to be a straight line. Was yeah. there was there anything particular that drew you to this particular um, notion of what you wanted to do with your life? Anything that anyone you admired or anything that you heard or did early on that put this into your head? Well, that's an interesting question because I, I keep telling people, I tell people all the time that uh, growing up in Jamaica, I should not be conducting orchestras <laughs> because in Jamaica at the time there was one orchestra called the Jamaica Philharmonic. And we as kids used to call it the Jamaica Foul Harmonic. That's how <laughs> good it was, right? And so technically, <laughs> I had no business being even interested in conducting, but my brother and I were always interested in collaborative things. And so I, I always thought that being able to rehearse and produce things that sounded the way you thought music should sound is, is the ideal thing to do. And so we were fortunate that my, our piano teacher who had come back from doing his studies at Boston University, a Jamaican, had you know spotted us and just said, you know, you guys can do whatever you want. And he was our first conducting teacher. I took my first conducting class with him. And he said to me, you can be a conductor if you want. 
And um, I guess that's where the seed came from. The interest was there, but but the affirmation helped. Yes. So, so after going to the East Coast, and this was actually obviously well more than 20 years ago, right. um, for a conductor to, at that time, come to the West Coast um, to come to a program at UCLA and then to stay on the West Coast was a bit of an audacious move rather than to go to Europe or to stay on the East Coast. Was there something that drew you to California? I mean, other than the obvious things that draw us to California, obviously the program at UCLA must must be must have been and be a terrific one. Was it the quality of the program at UCLA that drew you with? That certainly was part of it, but uh, let, let me just give you a tiny snippet of something that attracted me to the West Coast. My twin brother was here flying in California, but not only that, he had built a recording studio and was producing recordings for people. So he said, you know, I could use you out here. And so that didn't take much, um, you know, pleading or <laughs> convincing. I just said, well, that's a great idea because you know, I certainly prefer to live in California than in Boston. <laughs> so that was partly why I came here. But of course, the program at UCLA, um, a, a funny story about that is that after I came back from Europe studying in Vienna, the head of the program at UCLA was talking to me, you know, every time I saw him at an orchestra event somewhere, he would say, you know, we could use somebody like you at UCLA. I said, oh, no, I can't go back to school now. I'm just stupid. I'm tired of school. And he would ask again the following year, and I would just say, no, I just can't do that. And the third time he asked, the third time that I remember him asking, he said, you can get your doctorate for no, at no cost to you. And I said, why did you say that before? <laughs> and he said, I've been saying it for two years. <laughs> so it, the, the attraction at that point was not just that I could go to UCLA and I could get a doctor, but that I wouldn't have to pay for it, which of course made a big difference because then it meant I could literally give up some of the work I was doing to survive and go to school. And so that was, you can call it providence or call it fortune or what, but it, it, it made a difference. Yeah. Well, speaking of providence and where, where that takes us, um, even with this wonderful degree from UCLA, mm -hmm. I'm very interested in what brought you down the road to UCI. What was it about UCI? What was it about the Claire Trevor School of the Arts that attracted you? The, I, I, I often tell people I was forced to come here. Um, <laughs> I mean, humorously, of course, but it was a discussion between the chair at UCLA and the chair here. And they were about to have an opening and they needed somebody to fill in here. And everybody at UCLA, I was conductor of the musical theater workshop. That ah. was part of my assistantship. And then my other assistantship was as assistant conductor to Opera UCLA. And the head of that, the music director of that, was the head of the music staff at the LA Opera. So I was being exposed to some really, really good things and good people. Yes. So it was almost like everybody at UCLA just said, oh, he should go. You should tell them about him. He should go home. So I expected to be here for one year. And then I came down and we did some work and they asked me to apply for the permanent position, which I didn't want. I'll just be honest. But after a while of being here and working with our students and the faculty, seriously, I decided this was a place for me. I wanted to do. Well, we are certainly the winners from that. So let's hone in a little bit on what you are the head of here as the chair of the music department. It's a it's a really pretty unique department um, with a very unique way in which it actually interprets the original 
vision for the School of the Arts here when it was set up by the first dean, Clayton Garrison, who declared that what he wanted to establish, and this was along with the first chairs of all of the departments, very much including um, Colin Slim, the first chair of the music department, to actually have a school that presented itself as the conservatory within the academy. And so we have this double goal in the School of the Arts to Mm -hmm. model ourselves on conservatory orientation and the kind of academic orientation that's required, obviously, of a major research public university. And nowhere in the School of the Arts is that more obvious than in the music department. So let the folks who are watching and listening know a little bit about the the complexities and the great strengths and advantages of the music department of which you are the head. I I have the privilege of um, chairing presently. Uh, What you rightly say is a very diverse and yes, somewhat unique department because we do all the traditional performance activities. The students are pursuing you know, education to prepare them to be performers. But at the same time, the department um, flexes its intellectual muscles, I should say, in having a very uh, a very serious musicological approach. So we are now having PhD programs in not only uh, musicology, history theory, But we also have the thing that you might consider the most outstanding thing because it's unique that nobody else has. We have a program called Integrated Composition, Improvisation, and Technology. Every time I say Integrated Composition, I pause (laughs) because I want people to really soak up that, yes, composition. And then improvisation and technology. So all these things are, are, are built into this program. And it, the program attracts people from all over the world to do a PhD in this area. And we have amazing faculty in the department, in all areas, in piano, vocal area, you know, guitar, loop, everything. All the instrumental areas are represented. And then in ICIT, we have this cohort of faculty who can meet students from every walk of life who are interested in everything from, it could be as much as, you know, let's just say um, music that you would hear in recordings on the street or wherever, all sorts of things, people, Persian music, all sorts of things are represented in the department. So it is a very diverse, yes, area, but at the same time, they're all striving towards this one goal of preparing students to be participants in the world. And so students all go through the academic training and the the performance training, and they get opportunities to perform. Yeah, this is one of the most impressive things about the School of the Arts, something that I just love about all four of our departments. Um, It's particularly true in the music department. We, at at least certainly, not just at the undergraduate level, but across both graduate and undergraduate level, Mm -hmm. are interested in preparing what I would call citizen artists, people who are uh, sophisticated thinkers, sophisticated critiquers of public culture and society, as well as consummate performers and artists. It's um, it's a very high calling for the school and something that in all three areas of the music department, your scholarly area, your experimental area in ICIT and in the performance area, very, very strong commitment. The idea of the citizen artist, and I do have to say that even though that's a commonality across the areas of the department. There is one thing that's been going on lately that does separate the areas. And of course, what I'm talking about is COVID. Because in fact, for the scholars, as has been discovered across 
not only the UCI campus, but across the academic world for the scholars who are teaching seminars and you know book learning kinds of courses. COVID has been inconvenient, but you know, you just get on with teaching at a distance. But for the arts, this has been a really unique challenge. And I'm not sure that listeners and viewers to our conversation today, Stephen, really understand that it is the musician who has the most difficulty adjusting to this new virtual and distant technology. So say a little bit about what's happened during this year we've devoted to the um, dealing with the COVID situation. Yes, the greatest challenge, and, and I will come to it from this, this angle because I'm realizing more and more that students, faculty who engage in performance, um, you know, mostly, are having most of the psychological challenges because what the audience never really thinks about is that the, the performers get so much from being together and working in proximity with, with each other so they can share ideas and share sounds together because that's what right. drives them. Nobody goes into performance so they can be away from performance. <laughs> So that has affected us in that way. And then in terms of production and training, how do you train an orchestral musician to be an orchestral musician when they can't be in an orchestra? It's just not possible. Chamber music, the same thing. So uh, it has affected us in a dramatic way. It has affected the whole performance world dramatically. Uh, but one of the things we're fortunate to have is that we have faculty, as I mentioned before, especially in the ICIT area, where they have skills and knowledge about how to try to overcome some of these. One of our faculty members, Dr. Michael Gesson, has been doing telematic performances for a long time. So he's been performing with people from a distance. So he immediately jumped in and started doing more research and publicizing or publishing really ways to get around this and then we started trying to use that knowledge and technology to try to make students lives a little easier meaning that they could hear their teachers play to them and they could play to their teachers a little better because the environment in which we're operating right now you and i are speaking is not adequate for musical sounds. It can right. handle speech, but when it comes to musical sounds, you can't hear the tone quality of the instruments and the bandwidth doesn't seem to be able to translate all of that in real time. So we've been fortunate to have that. And then of course the university has supported you and um, the deans and, you know, provosts and so on, have come to realize how important it is and have assisted us in trying to overcome some of that. We will never overcome no. the, the problem of the distance, meaning being separated. So we are keeping our fingers crossed and rolling up our sleeves and hoping for everybody to be vaccinated and for COVID to give up um, interest in us and so we can get back together. Right. And early on, when this happened um, in March of 2020, when we all fled the campus and mm -hmm. went into our into our various caverns and dens and um, uh, places of refuge from from the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, we vowed in the School of the Arts that we were going to learn how to overcome this, as you point out, to the extent to which it's possible. Nothing really is the equivalent of getting your orchestra together on the stage or in a rehearsal room and working together. But within the context of what we've been able to do, one of the advantages, although it seems strange to say it, one of the advantages of this crazy shutdown time is that we have learned tremendous numbers of things in terms of the coping strategies that we are going to take with us out of the pandemic shutdown and be able to use. Some of it involves technology, some of it involves new ways of 
working together um, and working not so much together that we would have taken years and years to develop otherwise. We wouldn't have had to worry about it. And so we've tried to be very, very proactive in putting our, um, our, our heads together and thinking how we can solve some of these problems. As you point out, the work of Michael Desson and others in the music department, reducing latency and making it more possible to share music together, as opposed to just speech together like we're doing now, has been an enormous advantage that I think is going to be very, very interesting to people once we come out of this. But now one of the things that you do particularly, which I want to make sure people hear about, is to reach out beyond the campus. And the work that you have done, for example, up um, in Santa Ana with the orchestra there, and even in Riverside with the, the involvement that you've had off the campus have been so wonderful for students and citizens. Can you say a little bit about the, the, uh, the partnership that you've established with uh, Santa Ana High School? Absolutely. And um, but before I even talk about this, I have to mention somebody who, who uh, I just, you know, I, I can never speak about this without mentioning Megan Beaumont, because she became our outreach director just before this concept of partnering with Santa Ana High School came about. Uh, it, most people don't know the story that I was invited to a concert up at Santa Ana High School Arturo Sandoval, the um, trumpet player, was putting on a concert along with Sheila E. For those of us who are old enough to know, you know, the percussionist with, with Prince's group. And so I went and to my surprise, they sat me right in the front of the theater, a 1440 seat theater. My seat was right up front. So I was able to sit there and on stage, the students of Santa Ana, some string players were on stage they put them together to accompany, you know, various pieces. And so at the end of it, I went up stage, on stage and I gave my business card. Uh, I was about to say my credit card, but uh, I, I gave my business card to one of the conductors. I, I recognized them from doing all the running around on stage and said, look, I'm a conductor at UCI. If you need any help, just give me a call. It took some time, but they contacted us. And, um, you know, it, 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 it didn't even make sense to me at the time. All I knew was that these were students who were not getting the same opportunities as other people in the world, musically. So I thought there had to be something we could do. So I spoke with Megan. And Megan said, well, let's start from somewhere. And so I, she said, what would you like to do? And I said, well, here's what we could do. We could take the orchestra to three schools in the area. If you can get me appointments to take the orchestra to three schools, that would be great. But here, here are my conditions. The very first condition is this. Santa Ana High School has to be run. I don't care who else you find, if Santa Ana isn't in there or not going to any of those schools, which was my way of giving her something that I thought was impossible because I tried before with other people. And sure enough, months later, she came back and said, I got Santa Ana. And we went up there and we played. And then we had a meeting subsequent. I'm just skipping through quickly with the conductors here in your um, Dean's conference room. And in that meeting, I remember saying to them, I, I tell you what, we're just going to adopt you. And the room went silent. There were four of us in the room, the two conductors, Megan and me. And um, and then one spoke up and said, what do you mean by adopt? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. I just know when you adopt a child, you have to feed it. So we'll figure it out. And we left. They went back to their principal and asked them, is this even possible? And now, what, nine years later, I think, something like that. It is an unbelievable partnership. We call it family because... Our students go up um, on their time to coach their students. Mm -hmm. I go up and do some master classes, and we have at least two events per year to get. They visit UCI's campus, and we, they either just observe our rehearsal or they participate in the side-by-side. -side. 
And then we go up there and play a side-by-side -side concert with them. And because of our relationship, they asked us to come up and play our standalone concert with, for their community, which is the most beautiful thing to see when, when you look out and see all these little children and parents and grandparents and everybody in the audience. Uh, so that's been an unbelievable success. And, and the thing that Megan always wants to talk about, and I think I need to talk about more, is that part of the reason we were so attracted to that was we were told that their students were not applying to college. They just wouldn't. Right. And we said, oh, well, this is perfect because this is what we want to do. And this is why our slogan is, it's not just about music. We wanted to try to get them to be like our students who want right. to go to college. So within two years, which was just a mind-blowing thing, we had 11 students apply to college. And the most amazing thing was that one student had been accepted to UCI, not in music, but to UCI. And we just thought that was a miracle. And so it started out with America and it keeps going with America. It is amazing. I myself have been to that concert several times with all of the families and little kids, et cetera. And it is glorious. Although I have to tell you, I have no idea how you get both orchestras on that stage. <laughs> It is amazing. You would expect that somebody's going to get their eye put out with a violin bow, but you managed to do it. It's just, it's just a remarkable experience for them, and and I know for our orchestra students as well to be able to offer that kind of mentorship and partnership. Um, it's it's just been an amazing thing. It's it certainly is one of the most worthwhile things that we do in the School of the Arts. So I want to thank you very publicly for the work that you've done with that over the years. It's just been fantastic. But I know that there are some other things that you're doing, you as a department, uh, in uh, uh, in this time of COVID. Are there any events coming up in the music department that you want to point out? Um, even though we are obviously in a time when there are lots of limitations, the performances going on in all four of our departments, exhibitions in the art department, um, performances in the dance department, drama department, and music department are continuing. What's coming up in the music department? Well, one of the things coming up that I, I know I shouldn't talk about too much because nobody who, well, very few people who are watching this would actually have an opportunity to get into it, is that the jazz department has been continuously active. They and their students have figured out very quickly how to do virtual things, more than the rest of us. Um, the choral department has done it. And so they put out compilations you know, periodically. We also have the wind ensemble working on things that, uh, again, because of the, the restrictions on um, personal proximity, we will never get them together, but they can record their things, digitate their things, compile it, and then it becomes available to us. Outside of that, I don't know that I can advertise a whole lot because as I said before, you know, it, the restrictions don't allow us to, to participate even minimally. And if I, you know, I started an, an idea of getting back some of the orchestra students and making them play at a distance and mask and all that stuff. And then I realized how much I wanted to have that, but the rift it caused in the ensemble, because most people don't realize that the, the, our, most of our students don't come from Irvine or even Orange County. They come from far away. As a matter of fact, in my classes now, my virtual classes, I'm teaching people who are resident in Taiwan and China in all sorts of places, and they come to class. So when I put out a call for who's close to Irvine, and I'm checking, I mean, we've got all these people in San Francisco and all sorts of places who couldn't come for a, an isolated rehearsal or recording, but they are upset that they're being excluded. If you come up with this idea that 
a few people, people in Orange County could come and we could have maybe 16 people spread out. So it becomes now the challenge of how do I, do I really want to make a performance so badly that I would alienate some of the people and it would be the majority of the people. Yeah. So I have to take that into consideration and we just keep hoping we can get back together safely. No, absolutely. It, it, as I said, it is more difficult for the music department than for anyone, uh, anyone else. Really, in the not just in the School of the Arts, but across the campus, it's really been prohibitive. But we do seem to be reducing our numbers nationally and locally, which is very encouraging. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very hopeful that with the great advances in the vaccine situation across the country, we're finally now seeing light at the end of the tunnel and can actually begin to think about not returning to any kind of pre-COVID normal because we've learned so much and have changed so much mm -hmm. that the world is going to establish when we do come out the other end of this, which I hope will be very soon, mm -hmm. will be different. I would say better than when we went in. So the last thing I want to just check in with you about is where do you see the music department going? Do you have any projects or plans for the next phase of the Claire Trevor School of the Arts Department of Music that should be shared with our viewers and listeners? Yes, uh, one of the things I, I miss personally, and I think my students and the department as a whole miss is, is that we used to collaborate so much with dance, drama, other people used to collaborate with people across campus who you, you never thought about until now. COVID has brought the separation. We realized, oh my goodness, we, we we've lost that. So one of the things I am trying to get my faculty to focus on planning would be an opportunity to expand our productions. We'd say. Dance. I have had conversations with people around the country, composers who are pretty famous, who are writing things and in, in saying to me, your school of the arts, the only place that I can see where this can be done. This, this uh, composer, pretty famous composer in, in New York has written a, a work called The Cycle of the Earth. It's a big production that was designed for somebody like um, um, Prime Video or Netflix or uh, all these areas to pick up because there was a big video effort made to go with the composition. But he said, but there's dance necessary. And I don't know anywhere else where we could find that kind of closely knitted collaboration. And I want it done at GCI. Well, we were right on the verge of pursuing the idea. As a matter of fact, Molly, the chair of dance and I had spoken briefly about it. I think it was before she was chair. And we started thinking, well, how could we go ahead with this? Well, I see that as something that would involve the entire school of work because it would be screened video, and I've seen some of the videos, and it's just unbelievable. It's mm. National Geographic type thing. Mm. And then with, with the dance involved, integrated, and on, on stage with that, as well as instrumental. So I see that as a major project that I think our departments can really look forward to it because this becomes an international project. It mm -hmm. doesn't just get shown at UCI as our normal performances, but this is something that would be screened across the, at least the country. And especially with um, the climate change issues, it's just apropos. So that to me is one of the, the major things I see on the horizon. We would like to get back to our opera performances, of course. Well, and uh, you know, the combined things with choral 
And it, it, it's only when you lose it that you realize how much you miss doing those Amen, things. absolutely. Well, that sounds like just an amazing project. And in fact, this is something that I've been very interested in developing as well, the whole notion of genuine collaboration and working across what would be usually considered to be pretty much um, foreign territories, getting getting them together. And so the idea of collaboration, of interdisciplinary work at the most fundamental level strikes me as being the best of what we can take out of this shutdown time as we move into really essentially the the real 21st century university, which is going to be and already is all about collaboration and interaction, conversations and confrontations and collisions across disciplines. So it seems that's such a fantastically exciting project. I look forward to having the dance department and the music department develop it. So congratulations on having a very, very forward looking notion of what you want to be doing in the future. And I do have to say, it's been just wonderful to talk with you and to get to know a little more about what you do. I've learned a tremendous amount already from talking to you today. And I'm very grateful for everything that you've been doing in the music department, as of course, are your faculty and your students and the audiences that you attract both on and offline to events in the music department. Stephen Tucker, it's been just a great, great pleasure to talk with you today. Thank you for sharing all of your expertise and some great stories with us. Um, very much appreciate it. The next thing we'll be doing will be to talk to a couple of graduate students from the music department. Look forward to seeing how they are going to be fitting into this set of plans that you have for the future. So again, Stephen Tucker, Chair of the Music Department, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Dean Barker. Thank you.